This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for the Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. So, hey, glad to have you on, have you on board. Uh, do take a few moments to uh, give us a like or join us on Facebook with the uh, Pest Geek Podcast family. Uh, engage, say hello. We're glad to have you on board. Um, also, as I typically do, I invite people who have products or services or just want to uh, talk to the wider community. Perhaps you've done some research and you'd like to share. Uh, definitely reach out to me. And how do you do that? It's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. Wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Talk a little bit and we'll schedule a time to, uh, to do an interview with you. So uh, it's a way to reach, reach out there as we try to continue to expand the Pesky podcast family. So glad to have you on board. Uh, today, I was actually going to be interviewing someone else, but they decided uh, not to show up. That's even despite uh, my following up with them uh, a day or so ago, reminding them of the event. Oh, yeah, we're all set. Oh, okay. And then I texted them even today saying, are you going to be logging in? <laughs> Crickets. So uh, clearly uh, something went wrong, but uh, tell you, you want to find a way to annoy uh, annoy people that's just don't show up to a to an appointment even when you get reminders that just is pretty disrespectful uh, nevertheless it's not about me at the moment so I was looking to do this particular presentation just not at this particular time so I thought I would do it in terms of the time I've cut away uh, to do this interview since that fell through we're going to talk about it today what is that well, I wanted to talk a little about what I do in my day job. Many of you who've been following the Living the Wildlife podcast uh, have, have known that I am not a full-time wildlife control operator. In fact, I don't. I rarely do field research for clients in this regard. Why is that? Because I work for a government agency, and the government agency believes that it would be a conflict of interest for me to do business in the area that I help educate and moderately regulate. I'm not an enforcement person, but I do have some uh, role in that regard as well. And, and they do certainly have a point. Uh, the difference is, of course, where I'm located here in Montana, there's very little competition. So, in, you, you know, to have a conflict of interest in that regard, someone has to be losing, right? But I guess they're looking at it as I would be obviously crowding out potential people that would become self-employed themselves or perhaps do it for themselves, that you'd have a government worker competing with private, a private entity. So I, I certainly get that, but it is sort of frustrating at times because it would certainly improve me in many ways. So why do I talk about that? Because there's an idea within many wildlife control operators. We tend to have an underlying contempt, or perhaps it's too strong, perhaps a distrust of what they consider to be academics. And what's interesting is that when I'm with wildlife control operators, I'm treated as an academic. But when I'm with academics, I'm treated as if I'm a wildlife control operator. So I'm in this sort of in-between world where I've never really belong to the wildlife control industry and I don't belong to the academic industry and I'm always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's unfortunate to a certain degree because many times, sometimes, I shouldn't say many, because it's hard to say, uh, certainly there have been instances where I have felt uh, some negative energy, let's say, from individuals who think just because I do a lot of my work sitting behind a desk staring at a computer, that somehow I am not a legitimate person within the wildlife control industry. And I think that's unfortunate because uh, I have climbed roofs, I have climbed ladders, I've gone through crawl spaces, picked up dead skunks and that sort of thing. So uh, I was doing it before a lot of you who are listening right now have been doing it. So I was back in the 80s and of course I was full time uh, during the 90s. So 
that's unfortunate. I've been involved with the industry for a very, very long time, just to kind of give you a clue. Uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm not here to shill for the National Wildlife Control Operators Association, but I was a founding member. And by that, I mean, I was in the room in New Jersey when the proposal was made to start the association. So that's my bona fides, if you have any doubt about that. Certainly ask around, there was, I think we probably had 30 to 50 people in the room, uh, but that was way back in the two, early 2000, I think. And I think we officially started in 2001, I believe. So it's been a long, long time ago. So what do I do during my day job? But before I do that, let me just sort of state, I'm not here speaking for the department. I am speaking here on my own. The department has not endorsed what I'm saying. This, I am not speaking on behalf of the department. I'm simply talking to you about my day job because I think it may be helpful for you to understand what I do and what I don't do, and that might give you some insight in terms of what you think my, whether I still remain qualified to call myself a wildlife control operator. And I really don't use that term very much because I'm not doing the day-to-day -day field work that many of you, of course, are. However, but am I a member of your club? And I'll let you decide whether that's, whether that's worthy or not. Because I got into a sort of a pissing match with someone on social media one time, and they were quite negative about about me, uh, what gave me skills, and it was just it was sort of interesting to see how we're in our industry at times we're always looking to put each other down, and uh, I don't want anyone to think that I'm putting down practical experience within the industry. I have practical experience. Uh, Maybe not as much as you have, depending on how many years you've been in the business, but I've certainly been associated with the industry for a very long time, been to scores of training sessions, as well as provided scores of writing material as well, and publications and that sort of thing. And so we have this sort of tension between those who do and those who study and read. And so it, we shouldn't be seeing those two behaviors as necessarily antithetical to each other. If you're doing, if you're learning about wildlife control, being in the field and crawling through an attic, there's nothing wrong with that. And you're gaining experience and you're gaining knowledge from that. But so isn't the person who's gaining knowledge and experience reading journal articles and publications on wildlife behavior, or wildlife control techniques that have been done under scientific conditions. Those two things, the practical side and the research side, need to inform one another. It's not an either or, but if we don't have individuals who can bridge those types of gaps, then we basically have the academics talking to one another, and then we have the practitioners talking to one another, and they never talk to each other across the boundaries there. And that's, and I think that's silly. Um, and so, but we'll let you decide whether that's the case. But I want to be sure everyone understands. I am not talk. I am not speaking on behalf of the department here. This is just me. As a private citizen, I'm not on the clock right now talking about what my day job is because my wildlife control consultant business is just a side gig. My work here in the podcast, I'm not making money on doing this. If you think I am, you are uh, be glad to take your money, your donations, but I am not making any money on this now. Uh, so uh, someday, maybe, but at the moment, this is a labor of love because I want to be engaged and I think this is a way to reach out to the larger community. And this is an industry that I have loved for a very, very long time even when at times it hasn't loved me back. So, but enough about me, let's get started about what I do during the day. So I work for the Montana Department of Agriculture and I, my official title is the vertebrate pest specialist. So what that means is I deal with animals that have a spine, have to have a vertebrate, that are in conflict with humans. So different states classify wildlife in different ways. Here in the West, they have categories such as pest animals or vermin type animals, animals that are considered predators. Because again, in the West, we are a cattle, cattle raising part of the country. And so historically, 
certain animals did not have any form of legal protection because cattle ranchers viewed them as dangerous to their livestock. Same way with farming, farmers would see certain animals as damaging to their crops. So what would be some examples of some of these animals that have no legal protections? Uh, here in Montana, the coyote is one of those animals. So in Massachusetts, where I'm from, the coyote is considered a game animal and you have to have a license and there's a season for hunting for killing coyotes. Here in Montana, the coyote is a long-legged rat. You can kill the coyote at any time, practically in any way you deem necessary, other than probably something that would just be considered hyper cruel. And that would probably be hard. You might get fined, but that would, might be hard. But because coyotes are considered... Uh, Everyone loves dead coyotes. People hang them on fences out here to sort of show the world that they've killed another coyote. So another animal would be a pocket gopher. Many of you are familiar with pocket gophers. We have pocket gophers. We have prairie dogs. We have ground squirrels like the Richardson ground squirrel and the Colombian ground squirrel. All of these particular species have no legal protections within the state of Montana. And they're actually considered... so. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, which is our wildlife agency, they only can, they regulate animals that are not considered these types of pests. Even though they have statutory uh, oversight of all of these animals to be sure that they remain viable within the state, on a practical level, there are no seasons and they do not govern them. So you can set a trap in Montana for a coyote without a license. But if you're setting a trap for a beaver, you're going to have to have a license. Why? Because a beaver is considered a fur bearer. That's a legal definition. Not It's also a biological definition. But for, legally, they're a fur bearer. So legally, they have certain protections, meaning you can only trap beavers in certain seasons of the year. Whereas with a coyote, you can put a trap out any time of the year. And so there's a lot, things are a lot looser. Think of it as, do you have regulations governing the control of rats and mice where you're at? And my suspicion is no, why? Because they're not native species and everyone wants them gone. Well, even though the species that I'm dealing with primarily are native species, they are not popular here we are primarily in that we are still a significant agricultural state. So the laws have not changed. So that is what I deal with. So my job then is to help people, whether they be producers, which means ranchers and farmers, deal with these conflicts, or people that are just simply homeowner, property owners like you do. So I provide advice and insight and training to help them resolve these particular conf conflicts. So let me pull up my, let me pull up a page where I'm at here. Let's go to Montana Department of Agriculture. Okay, so here we go. We have our Montana Department of Agriculture. So here we go. And so if basically come to our homepage, this is our acting director, and you click Department Topics, and then over here in the lower right-hand corner is Vertebrate Pest. And that brings you to my page, okay, the page that I control as part as underneath the Department of Agriculture website. And you'll see a calendar there of different things that are that I'm involved in if you want. And then we get to this section, talks about you can search for pesticides because I am also involved with the management of M44s. Now M44s are sodium cyanide devices that are used for the control of coyotes. They can be used for the control of feral dogs and foxes, but typically the vast majority of their use, and they're not used much, uh, is for the control of depredating coyotes. That is coyotes that are interfering with agricultural interests. And then you can search licensed pesticide applicators. And here we get to the Montana Vertebrate Pest Bulletins. So if you scroll farther down the page or just click that link, you can see publications that I have been involved in either creating from, creating on my own, or revising because obviously Richardson ground squirrels were here in, in the state long before I came. And so I've been responsible for revising these publications and updating them to help people and educate them on the various methods to control 
these species. So I have a publication on bats and I have a publication on living with starlings. And you may say living with starlings, yes, because um, we're not gonna get rid of all of them most likely, but I do talk about some control methods to help people manage them. How to deal with woodpecker damage. So let's pull up this one. Now woodpeckers are a protected species because they're federally protected, right? They're part of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. However, they're still an animal that damages structures. And so I wanna help people manage this damage within the confines of the law, right? You can't just kill woodpeckers here in Montana, uh, not, be, not only because of state law, but also because of federal law, because of the Migratory Bird Act. And so this gives some information about controlling woodpeckers and managing them in Montana within the law. And then if all of these quote unquote non-lethal methods don't work, then we also tell them to we refer them over to getting a depredation permit with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, so we close that out. Let's look at another one. I have one on skunks. Skunks are considered a predator within Montana, meaning that as a predator, there are no legal protections for skunks. And so we have the spotted skunk, which is pretty rare in Montana. There's actually a species of concern, but you're still allowed to kill it at will here in Montana. Although the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks would appreciate it if you would not do that unless you contact them. You are not legally, to my knowledge at this time, required to do so. But most of the skunks we have is striped skunks. And the rabies within Montana, of course, bats can certainly carry rabies. That's pretty much the same across the entire country. But our terrestrial rabies here in Montana is skunk rabies, where in other states it would be raccoon rabies. Here in Montana, skunks are the primary terrestrial, that means land-based vector of skunks. And so I have a publication here on, on skunks that help people deal with odor and how to trap them and how to keep them out of their property and things of this nature. So those of you who have followed my publications from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln will see a lot of similarity here because, you know, the information is the information. And so it's just basically Montanaized or updated from earlier publications. And so this, this is a significant part of my job. It's not all of my job, but it's a significant part of my job. And that is to make sure that I keep these publications up to date for our constituents here within the state of Montana. But for those of you who are outside of the state, there's certainly a lot of information here that you can certainly use should you decide to do it. And there's no charge. I don't call anything. It's not free because this was paid for. I understand that one of my pet peeves is that nothing the government does is free. If you ever hear a politician or a government official telling you something is free, I consider that a form of lying because none of it's free. It's paid for by taxpayer dollars. So how I phrase it is that you it's not free. You just don't have to pay for it again, right? Because taxes or fees, someone has paid for this material. You just don't, we just don't charge you a second time for it, okay? So we have information on identification to help people identify with pests. A lot of people are not familiar with the differences between a Richardson ground squirrel and a Colombian ground squirrel. I have a publication here on snakes so that people would just perhaps get a little more educated about snakes and so that we can avoid just simply, just like other states, people just sort of willy-nilly kill snakes because there's a tremendous amount of paranoia about snakes. So we do some education in that area as well. And then of course, the majority of my work is in the area of rodents. And this is where I talk about controlling mice and structures, of course. This is a publication I'm pretty proud of. Some work on mice and structures, help people manage to manage mice. And then, then we also have information on pocket gopher techniques. You may say, well, Stephen, I don't see anything here on rats. Well, the reason is, is that we don't really have a lot of rat damage here in Montana. As far as Norway rats are concerned, roof rats don't appear to be present in the state. I'm sure occasionally one may hop off a train or something, but we do have Norway rats, but their, their numbers are so small, it's almost not even worth dealing with. We do have the bushy tail wood rat. Unfortunately, I don't have enough background information to create a publication on the bushy tail wood rat. So I'm hoping to have a publication on that 
uh, down the road as I gain as I gain some experience with that particular species. And of course, because we are the Department of Agriculture, we deal with pesticides. And so we have pesticides that are used for these vertebrate animals. And so this is something that's a little different than many what you're doing. A lot of you are using pesticides uh, so, such as rodenticides used in control house mice and rats and structures. And so you're putting them in bait stations and you're, they're very limited in their effect. Here in Montana as an agricultural state and prairie dogs, we, prairie dogs is, we have certain species that we can broadcast bait. So you can actually have a spreader and you're putting out zinc phosphide laced bait out over large landscapes. We even have aerial drops that's illegal here in Montana. So if you have voles, for instance, you can have an aerial drop of zinc phosphide so you can cover a lot of acres to control voles. Prairie dogs, we have what's called spot baiting where you would go out with, a, with, with toxicant and put it down either in the burrow or beside the burrow, depending what type of pesticide you're dealing with. Or, and then of course you have fumigants, so you can fumigate the burrow as well. So these are things that many of you in a more urbanized states would be like, wow, that's, that sounds crazy. But and it, it, it was for me as a city boy, I, I am not from an agricultural state. I mean, Massachusetts has agriculture, but nothing like what we have here. When I first arrived in Montana, I was talking with a landowner and I find out his ranch is 15 square miles. Uh, that I think that's bigger than the city I grew up in. So his the property he had control over was 15 square miles. I mean that's the staggering distances. It's really hard for those of you on the East Coast, I think, to ponder that because it's still shocking to me in terms of the size and scope of the state of Montana. We are it's simply massive and empty. We, we just got our second representative uh, from this last census here. And so we're still only around, I think, 1.3 million people. I mean, some of you live in states where you have that in the city. Uh, so it, it's truly remarkable. So in any ways, getting back to these publications, this is a significant part of my job. I talk about bait stations around structures uh, because people have obviously issues with rodents around buildings and agricultural facilities and so all of this is is right here then I have links to other publications that I've written in other uh, jobs that I've had that are available down here as well and then of course I have contact information on how to reach me and so this is a again a significant portion of my job but is it all of my job and the answer is no it's not I also have the obligation of doing something to the extent of where I provide training. So part of my job here is, let me kind of pull up a state map up here and let's, you know, just to kind of show you how large of a state we have, to kind of show you, let's pull this up. So here we have uh, the state of Montana and I'm up here in Lewistown. I'm right smack dab in the middle of this particular state. So most of you, when you visit Montana, you you only care about the western end of Montana. Well, there's a lot more to Montana because uh, we have Yellowstone down here in the southwest corner. A lot of you are just here in the mountains because that's considered the pretty part of Montana. And it is absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous, don't get me wrong. But there's a lot more to Montana than just simply the Rocky Mountains. And so I'm here in the middle of the state. So to give you an idea of just how large our state is, it can take you anywhere from about uh, six to seven hours at 80 miles an hour to cross the state and probably take you five hours to go from north to south. So if you're taking I-80, now granted I-80 doesn't, I mean I-90, excuse me, doesn't go directly across in a horizontal fashion. It actually comes as a sort of a modified V. It's still gonna take you seven hours or so to cross it, and that's at 80 miles an hour. Our, our interstate highways are 80 miles an hour. Our state highways are 70 miles per hour during the day at 65 miles per hour at night. So you're supposed to drop down five minutes. It's simply, it's simply massive. So part of my job is to go around the state and provide pr presentations and trainings. Now those trainings occur in two different ways. And, and today it's now three different ways because of COVID. 
So the first way is that I just come in and do a PowerPoint presentation and I may have some props and I talk about trapping pocket gophers and how to poison them and I'll talk about the biology. So typically I'll talk about the biology of the animal, how to identify the damage, and then I'll survey the various methods on control. Pretty straightforward, right? But I have to create these PowerPoints and I update them all the time. And so as I continue to do more research and read, I get into the more granular information because people are looking desperately for ways of managing these pet these vertebrate pests because they cause significant economic damage to agricultural production in the state of Montana. And and remember, for some of these farmers, this is not just a side gig for them. This is their livelihood. And this is how they make their living. And my job is to try to help them within the confines of the law address these concerns in the most efficient method possible. So I will do presentations with PowerPoint. Another way I do training is we'll actually have a workshops where we will have uh, individuals come and we'll try to do some hands-on type things where we don't just talk about trapping pocket gophers, we'll actually have people setting traps for pocket gophers, at least get their hands dirty and get how to find probe for the hole and that sort of thing. So we'll have workshops. Now the third way we do training now, of course, is with webinars. And that has been because of COVID last year, a lot of things shut down. We started moving into a lot more online training. And so I've been involved in creating narrated PowerPoints. We put, we're now developing, we're now putting things up on Moodle, which is a learning management system. And with this year we'll be launching, we're, pest control operators or people who have wildlife control operator who are wildlife control operators who want the training can come on in and take pay the fee take the training online and, and listen to me do a PowerPoint presentation and then there'll be a quiz and then they get some CEU credits for their pesticide license understand here in Montana we have no wildlife control operator license so if you're looking for a place to start a new business where you want minimal regulation Montana may be a place for you to do it, but understand that you are going to have a mark, a population problem because you need to have people. But if you're willing to travel and put in some long hours and get yourself established, um, you can make a living here in Montana. So if you're interested in coming, definitely reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about how you can improve your odds of making a living here in the state of Montana because we have no wildlife control operator license. So you could start day one. Now, if you're looking to get a pesticide license, that's pretty easy to get as well. You can't start obviously on day one, but you can get it pretty easily here in Montana because we don't have the two tiered system of other states where you have to be under someone else's license for two years before you can go out on your own. You can start here, pass your exams, and if you have, if we have reciprocity with your state, you may just have to take the Montana portion of the core uh, and maybe some of your categories, it can be a lot easier to come in and you can start your business straight away if you're looking to do pest control or use pesticides for vertebrate control. So anyways, if you're interested, I'm happy to help you with that. Uh, so, cause you're not going to be competing with me. My job is to help. If you want to start a business, I'm happy to help you start your business here in Montana in terms of wildlife control or even pest control, should you decide to do that. Now that's, so those are the two, two main areas of my work with the state. So people would sometimes call me up and ask for advice and I'd send them information. The third aspect of my job is research. And it's a very small portion. I don't want to overstate it. It is certainly a small portion and I would like to see it grow. But doing research, of course, is expensive and, of course, very time consuming. However, I was able to do some interesting research this, uh, this summer, and, and fascinatingly enough. And so let me um, look this up for you, Burrow RX, pull that up. And again, I, I'm not trying to shill here for this particular product per se, but I did use the Burrow RX uh, in some research this past this summer trying to determine how long the injection time should be when we're dealing with prairie dogs. So if you read company literature, it tells you that you need to inject for a burrow for about three minutes. But the research was done on, I believe it was, sort of a cousin to the California ground squirrel, if memory serves correctly, but it was a ground squirrel, not a prairie dog. Now, a prairie dog obviously is a ground squirrel, but the reason we dis distinguish between the two of them is ground squirrel burrows tend to be only three inches wide. 
prairie dog burrows can be, you know, uh, seven or eight inches wide. And of course, they're significantly larger. So we're dealing with a significantly larger air mass. And so the carbon monoxide generators work on the basis of taking carbon monoxide off a gasoline powered engine, and then you inject it down the burrow at sufficient concentration to suffocate the animal inside with carbon monoxide. <clears throat> So size of the burrow obviously matters. And so no one knows how long you should do it. Now, there is certainly anecdotal information. Now, the anecdotal information that I heard was four minutes. But different machines would obviously put out gas at different rates. So they sent me this particular product, I think, three years ago. And it's been sitting in my office. And I said, all right, now this year, I'm going to go out and try it out to see because it's certainly becoming a more popular device. Why? Because there's no regulations in Montana regarding the Burrow RX or any other carbon monoxide generator because we don't regulate devices. So I was able to try it out and that was, I had a couple of locations to play with it a little bit. And so my research, just to kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of what it was, was purely an efficacy study. I basically selected prairie dog burrows where I had a confirmed prairie dog inside the burrow. In other words, I would come out to this particular location, I would look for prairie dogs, and when I saw a prairie dog stick his head up out of a burrow or run into a burrow, I would take the device over to that burrow, fumigate the burrow, close it up, and then wait for another one to stick his head up. And so I would only treat burrows that I had a confirmation of a prairie dog in. Then I would follow up at that location to see if there was a dig out. So to make a long story short, I started initially with a four minute injection time. And basically the efficacy was, I believe over 90% control. Not bad, uh, given the dry conditions of the soil that I was dealing with. I then tried to do some work with three minutes 45 seconds and was also getting some success but there was clearly a drop but my sample size was a little small i then went to another location i figured all right well let me i'm running out of time because at my time my study was i was doing all my work within five days and so i really wanted to kind of ratchet things up a little bit and so i said let's try doing it for three minutes and I was able to get, if memory serves, somewhere around 80 to 85% control at three minutes. Now, you may think, oh, three minutes is not a big deal, but let me, let me tell you, it's a big deal when you're dealing with 40 acres. Now, I wasn't dealing with 40 acres, don't get me wrong, but my point is, is that if you are a producer, the difference between injecting a burrow for three minutes and versus four minutes means hours when you're dealing with larger, larger locations. I was also able to determine whether what happens with your efficacy if you have multiple burrows, because one of the benefits of the Burrow RX is there's smoke oil, so you can actually tell whether two holes are connected. Now, many people believe that prairie dog burrows have more than one hole. And that's certainly what I always thought. Well, lo and behold, the work that I was doing, the, ma the vast majority of burrows for prairie dogs were single hole. They only had one entrance. And what was interesting is that when the prairie dog burrow had like three burrows, three holes or more, the efficacy clearly dropped. Now again, my sample size for those multiple burrows was small, but I think it does give us an insight. So my practical advice for people, and I'm gonna write this up probably for the vertebrate pest conference, my practical advice is try three minutes for if you're only dealing with one hole, but if you end up having other holes, if you see smoke coming up, just extend your treatment for another 30 seconds for every new hole that you see. And I think you're gonna have a pretty good effect, probably up maybe as high as 90% control at that rate. And that would certainly be far more efficient. Now I need to add a couple other caveats here. That is you wanna make sure that your engine is at, there's a, a rabbit symbol. You'd wanna be sure that the engine is running at full rabbit, I call it. I call it full rabbit. So you wanna have it full up. And uh, otherwise, and that works pretty well. So this is part of my job, again, is to do this research 
to see if we can find the most effective and cost-effective way to help producers and landowners resolve conflicts with the animals. So sometimes my research is simply to prove proof of concept, for instance, where I will uh, test out a trap to see if the trap can be used. And that's part of my job. See, those are things that most wildlife control operators don't have the time to do because it's tedious. You know, you have to time yourself, you have to record your data, you have to do things methodically, where when you're in business, you don't, you, you don't have to, you're not gonna be writing a paper on this, you're, you just need to kill the animals, right, or, or solve the problem. Well, when you're doing research, it, it's a lot more headache because you've gotta keep records of everything because you have to have something that's statistically reliable to show that this is actually the way to go. You need to do enough work to see if, your early success may be just an outlier, like just an accident, so you need to do it long enough. Plus, my getting out into the field helps me become a better educator so that I can feel the experience in the trials that applicators have, and that's something that, that's very important to me. I wanna be sure that I understand things from your, from the applicator's perspective. So that's one of the things I really enjoy about my job and that is I don't have to worry about whether I'm gonna give away a secret that's costing me money. My job is to help other people get the job done in, the, in a cost-effective way within the boundaries of the law. So when they succeed, I succeed because I'm fulfilling my job responsibilities. So that's essentially what I do. So if you think I don't have any field experience, that's not true. I do have field experience. I'm just not doing it every day because a lot of times I'm in an office and I'm researching, I'm looking up journal articles, I'm talking with people who are struggling with wildlife problems. So I'm learning from them and then I go to training events and learn from you as well. And of course, look at things online and look at things in the journal literature and also perform research myself to try to contribute information to the wider wildlife control industry. So that's, as, whether you think that's glamorous or not, that's basically my job. I'm, I'm an educator and with a little bit of a research component, my, my role is to help people resolve those conflicts as well as, and so that information that I gain from you, the information I gain on my own, it all mixes together to try to improve our industry. And I do hope that you find it a blessing for yourself because I want you to be more successful and responsible in our treatment of wildlife so that we can resolve these conflicts in a responsible, effective, way and that's kind of my mission so that's basically what I do in my day job and um, I hope you found that interesting and not if not insightful so again I'm Stephen Van Tassel I'm the owner of wildlife control consultant this is you've been listening to living the wildlife podcast again if you have an interest of being on the show I'd be glad to have you just just be sure you show up if we make an appointment uh, reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. would also love your ideas for shows that you'd like to do. So would love to hear, hear those ideas because that way I'm presenting something that's not just of an interest to me because I have my interests may not conform with your interests, and I'd love to be able to provide some information that you have an interest in as well. Would love to get that. So again, you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear from you. And again, this is Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.